I've never done this before, and I promise I'm only saying this for the purpose of gathering data, but remember to subscribe and hit the bell. Okay, I understand people's opinions of this chapter are a bit divided, so I'm gonna start off with the least controversial thing you'll hear today. This episode looks drop-dead gorgeous. The set pieces are vibrant, and Volume 9 continues to demonstrate its mastery of nuance in the facial expressions and the body language. Jean being attacked by Penny and Pyrrha stings real good, and it's one of the best snippets of animation I've seen in the volume. I swear, Curious is one of the best things to ever happen to the series. The animation and Robbie's performance are endless endlessly entertaining, especially when he's walking around in front of the door. It really looks like someone did a full-on motion capture performance. Props to whoever did that, you nailed the movement. They even got rid of the voice modulation. I am not complaining. Zombie Ruby was not something I was ready for. It gave me a chill down my spine, and I loved it. The soundtrack and score in this chapter did not miss. I got some real strong Nier Automata vibes near the end especially. It's great stuff. We even got a little spin on Red Like Roses in the piano at 1344. With the advent, of Deus Ex Yellow Door, we now officially have a way out. If you had any doubts we were gonna have a conclusive season this year, you can probably rest easy now. But if I just YouTube rewind my way back to the beginning real quick, Summer Rose. What a terrific way to open the chapter. I was hooked right away. Morgan's delivery and reading the bedtime story hit the nail on the head for me. I want to listen to her read the entire book. Ruby encounters the blacksmith once again, and just like chapter 5, I loved every second of it. And Lindsay Jones absolutely stunned me with her nuance. When Ruby asked if she was gonna die, I felt that in my freaking soul. Even though she's the one that took the leap, the choice was forced upon her before she could truly comprehend its significance. This three second exchange hits so ridiculously hard, it is unreal. Someone give this girl a hug already, god damn. One detail that I found really neat was that the blacksmith was hammering a mouse mask, presumably crafting Little's new form because, well, you know, from this day forward, you shall be known as Big. It also gives some clarity as to what the butterfly wings from Chapter 5 were all about. These close-ups don't especially flatter the water simulation, so it probably would have been best if they just stuck to the wide shots. I found this punch-in on Ruby's face very distracting. Punch-ins are generally associated with comedy, so perhaps try to avoid sneaking them into tender dialogue scenes. Weiss, Blake, and Yang continue to draw the short straw as far as character moments are concerned, and they're really starting to feel like a casualty of screen time at this point. I'm under the impression that we skipped a major plot beat between the end of chapter chapter 8 and the gem scene from chapter 9. We went from some of the harshest trauma ever presented in the show to a group hug and discussion of acceptance. Don't get me wrong, the gem scene is lovely, but the unfortunate side effect of that tonal whiplash is it makes these three come across as nonplussed by what happened to Ruby. They don't really make much of an effort to go after her. In fact, they don't even discuss Ruby at all until they reach the tree. And to make matters worse, once they find her, they just casually sneak in this line. We've done everything we can. Yang tried pulling the leaves and branches away, but please, for my own sanity, name one single other thing they have tried. It has been five minutes. In most other circumstances, I wouldn't come down as hard on something like this. But we just saw Ruby give up entirely, commit English breakfast, and the possibility of her physical body and memories being erased from existence, which is functionally death in my book, is not zero. It also has the potential to muddy up some messaging about one particular sensitive topic, but I'm still waiting to see how they follow through in chapter 10 before I try stepping over that landmine. I don't usually make predictions, but it's the penultimate episode, so I'm making an exception today. To boost the probability of my own correctness, I hereby present four possible outcomes. I simply cannot wait to be proven incorrect five minutes after this video releases. Option one, Ruby backs out of her decision, realizing that fleeing the consequences of her past will not allow her to truly grow as an individual. Option two, Ruby touches Summer's weapon, and as a result, gets a new physical form and appearance, taking her memories with them. But, as per the cat's line in chapter 5, perhaps we'll get a Wally situation, where her friends remind her who she is and awaken the memories resting dormant within her. Option 3. Ruby touches Summer's weapon, and through either illusion, flashback, or some other metaphysical manifestation, she has a conversation with her. Ruby tries to persuade Summer to take her place because the burden is just too much, but Summer says otherwise, reminding Ruby why she wanted to be a huntress in the first place. And this 
this conversation provides the motivation she needs to return to the fight. Option four. Jean dies of fall damage, ends up in the green cyberspace, and lands on Ruby before she can make her decision. As much as I personally enjoyed Chapter 8's hard-as-nails edginess, I am glad they toned down the intensity for this one. It's a good palate cleanser. I want to make it abundantly clear that despite the major issue I cited earlier, my experience with Chapter 9 still consisted of more positives than negatives. It's unfortunate that this issue has such far-reaching consequences, but the least we can do is wait and see how Chapter 10 resolves it, since this is a two-parter. Anyways, short episode, short video, catch you later.